Okay, good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Jean Fajadé. I'm a co-chairman of uh, PCR. Uh, really uh, lucky uh, today to work uh, and share this station with uh, Rasha and uh, uh, RF. Um, the title of the session is Complex PCI in Eye Bleeding Risk Patient, The Way For What. This session is sponsored by uh, Terry Mo Company. And uh, concerning the uh, three major objectives, uh, they are the following. First of all, if we have a get the, the, the first slide, the first uh, uh, learning objective is to uh, tailor the PCI strategies in eye bleeding risk uh, patient. The second is to reflect about uh, DES selection in complex PCI for eye bleeding risk patients. And the third one is to review Ultimaster DS result with short DAPT in eye bleeding risk trial. So, I would like to start, uh, the, the, we would like to start uh, this uh, session by uh, a lecture uh, on the uh, Ultimaster uh, uh, data. And uh, Rasha will uh, talk about uh, the Nagomi uh, DS launch and the key findings uh, from master the APT clinical trials. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. All right. So in the next couple of minutes, we're going to be talking about the, the newer generation of Ultimaster, Ultimaster Nagomi, which was launched in Europe after your PCR and will be launched in the Middle East after this conference. Um, so Nagomi actually is a Japanese word for heartwarming, just if you're wondering where the name came from. Uh, no, no relevant disclosures. Uh, so the Ultimaster has, uh, this is the third generation, so we've got, they started with Ultimaster, Ultimaster Tensei, and, and Ultimaster Nagomi. Um, and the idea of this evolution is that they're trying to improve both deliverability and the over-expansion. Um, so the inherited platform, so it comes in three platforms. The middle one is the inherited platform uh, for a vessel size between 275 and 30, and it goes up to 4.5, but it also comes in a newer, smaller version, uh, so 2 to 2.5 vessels that could be expanded to 3.5, and a larger vessel uh, design that uh, goes from 3.5 to 4.5, with a great design that actually can over-expand to 6.25. Um, so it, uh, so the, the two main things, as we talked about, is that the overexpansion and the deliverability. So one of the things that they have is the highly flexible uh, components of the metals uh, that will make it easy to deliver the, uh, the stent itself, and it helps also with overexpansion. So the stent design um, the, with the newer uh, format uh, helps with the overexpansion. We talked about how the vessel, uh, the stent could be expanded to 6.25. And this is actually one of the main um, advantages of this uh, particular stent compared to other stents, uh, especially if you have ectatic vessels that we really don't have much of stents uh, to offer them on the market um, for, with the drug eluding stent. Uh, the other thing, aside from the sizing in, certain, in terms of diameter, they also have newer uh, lengths, so 44 millimeter and a 50 millimeter, so it works good for uh, long lesions. Um, so in, in total, in terms of dia mixing diameters and uh, length, we have 88 sizes. Um, uh, there's a new hydrophilic coating that Im Im improves the uh, deliverability as well in the expansion here. And the data goes back to mostly older generation of um, Ultimaster. There are, a lot, there are a lot of trials that looked at this, but the main focus of this is going to be Master Adapt, uh, which talks about one month adapt and high bleeding risk. So to dive into this uh, in more detail, so the Master Adapt is an investigator-initiated randomized trial, uh, looked at uh, more than 45,000 patients. Um, it is a worldwide um, uh, study that actually involved more than 30 countries, including Saudi. Um, and it was for all comers coming in with high bleeding risk after PCI. So they looked at abbreviated versus standard dual antiplatelet therapy, and this was with the Ultimaster um, stent and Ultimaster Tensei before the Nagomi. 
Um, so this was study design. So they would come in, get their PCI, and after one month, they would be randomized to abbreviated duct and non-abbreviated duct. So the abbreviated duct, within each arm, there's also a, an arm for oral anticoagulation. So if they come in with abbreviated duct uh, and they have an indication for uh, oral anticoagulation, duct will be stopped, um, and you, you would do single antiplatelet for five months, so that gives you six months. Um, and then after that, oral anticoagulation for at least more than 11 months. Um, if they don't have an indication for DAPT, then uh, they would uh, stop um, uh, with single antiplatelet. So we'll continue with single antiplatelet after the first month. Um, if in the standard arm, non-abbreviated, uh, you would do at least six months of DAPT, um, followed by uh, an aspirin for more than uh, for, for 12 months or more. And if there is an indication for oral, oral anticoagulation, uh, DAPT will be done for three months and then um, followed by SAPT uh, and then an oral anticoagulation uh, beyond 11 months. So the, uh, the key thing is that the, the primary endpoints were both MACE, MACE as well as uh, bark bleeding as well. So this was published in New England Journal of Medicine, as most of you know already. Um, so aside from the fact that it showed non-inferiority in both NACE and MACE, it actually showed superiority when it comes to major or cl clinically relevant uh, non-major bleeding. So you could see the difference in the right hand uh, of your screen. So 9.4% of bleeding in the standard DAPT arm uh, versus 6.5% in the abbreviated DAPT arm. Um, so from the master adapt, there are a lot of other more publications that um, publish in high impact journals ta talking about the different patient population um, as well as 15 months results. So given the one month DAPT um, safety results that shows actually superiority when it comes to bleeding, um, the, the, guideline, the recent guidelines, ESC, ESC ACS guidelines, have changed their recommendations giving high bleeding risk patients a 2B indication for one month DAPT. Um, and this was uh, one of the main uh, changes that happened after the master DAPT. Uh, so with that, we conclude our presentation, moving on to the case. Thank you, Rasha, for uh, giving this uh, <coughs> lecture on the uh, on the, uh, the principal uh, really advantages of this uh, drug eluting stent, and uh, we will see this uh, uh, advantage in the the, the case uh, presentation uh, performed uh, in the clinic Pasteur Toulouse uh, a few months ago. Um, I will. Uh, Present you the but it's interesting to have the, in the same uh, feature a great uh, deliverability of the stent, an excellent flexibility in tortuous vessel, and uh, the po possibility to have uh, this uh, I don't know 80 pos different possibility of uh, length and size uh, in patient with free vessel disease. And so we will uh, present uh, the case, and we move to uh, Toulouse. So the patient today uh, is a really fragile uh, patient. Uh, she's an 86-year-old female, and uh, who was referred to the uh, clinic pastor for the non-STEMI with acute pulmonary edema and uh, with uh, impaired left ventricular function. Uh, characterized by the LV ejection fraction at 45%, associated with a moderate aortic stenosis. Concerning the prior clinical history, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, this woman had a paroxystic history of paroxystic atrial fibrillation, multiple uh, uh, venous thrombosis, and an episode of pulmonary embolism a moderate uh, aortic stenosis. Risk factor are the following hypertension and particularly type 2 diabetes mellitus. When you look at the cl global clinical presentation of this woman, really a high impression of fra fragility, particularly a weight of 44 kilogram. Uh, lifestyle, to be honest, this, wo this woman was partially dependent. Medical therapy was the following and concerning the laboratory investigation 
we could see that uh, serum creatinine was uh, at uh, 62 uh, micromole and uh, pro BNP at 512 picogram per milliliter. Non-invasive evaluation was the following. ECG showed at the time of the hospitalization a normal sinus rhythm with no significant ST or T abnormality. And concerning the transthoracic echocardiography, LVF was 45% with a global LV hypokinesia and uh, aortic valvaria at 1.1 square centimeter. This is the baseline angiography. You could see uh, on the left uh, screen a uh, long, diffuse, and critical disease involved the proximal and mid in the origin of the distal LED, which is uh, in distality a good vessel, and involving uh, uh, the origin of two uh, uh, small uh, uh, diagonal branches. On this view, uh, you could see that the uh, left main is quite short. We are here selected with the Judkins catheter of the proximal left circumflex artery. And this circumflex artery shows a proximal significant uh, lesion uh, before the bifurcation uh, OM1, OM2, which is uh, critically diseased. Concerning the right coronary artery, uh, there is a critical lesion on the proximal segment, which is, uh, <coughs> we had a really uh, great curvature. And in the distality, there is a diffuse ateroma, but without critical lesion. So, uh, in conclusion, when the, we discussed uh, the potential rascularization for this woman, the heart team uh, uh, were in favor of a multivessel uh, PCI. And uh, when we look at the, and we could make a stop here, at the, 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 this uh, three vessel disease, which is critical LED diagonal lesion, this critical and long lesion on the circumflex OM branches, and the critical proximal uh, RCA lesion, uh, we decide to move to the PCI. So we can make a stop, and I will ask you, uh, uh, Rasha, uh, when we look at this uh, clinical presentation, really a fragile octogenarian woman, what will be your strategy? So uh, less is more. So I would try to. So obviously this lady has a lot of risk factors. She's old. She's 86. She's coming in with non-STEMI already high risk non-STEMI with pulmonary edema. Um, she's on anticoagulation, so high high bleeding risk. So when you're putting her, uh, when when you have to stent, you have to think about a high risk of bleeding if she's on triple agents, which we're trying to avoid here. Um, and if if. Um, if you're going to stent her and you put her, stop some of the antiplatelets, then you also have to worry about stent thrombosis. So what is the balance here? What's the literature saying? Um, so definitely there are lesions that are very critical, the mid-LED and the RCA. The CERC, at least in the OM, is moderate, but in, uh, in proximal CERC into the second branch looks diseased. Uh, there's some disease in the distal RC, as you said, that will leave it for medical therapy. But I would try to tackle all three of them, image, uh, image guided for sure, to make sure we've got good expansion of the stent. Um, that way you're safe stopping the antiplatelet and continuing with anticoagulation afterwards. RF concerning the, the type of revascularization, single vessel revascularization, uh, certainly the LED, which looks uh, the more critical, or complete vascularization in the same time or in the two consecutive uh, uh, sequence? Thank you, John, for this uh, case, first of all. And then, yeah, that's a good question, actually. What we do in our practice, I would say, make it easy for myself, it depends on a couple of things. Now, we covered that this is a high bleeding risk, for sure. That is no doubt. Elderly, uh, with dependent, partially dependent, 
whether it be my 40, 45, I'm sure she won't come back again. Critical three lesions. And uh, I know if I send her home, she won't come back again. <laughs> this has been in our environment, and also here, culture, this lady will not come back again. And they can be managed easily, the three vessels. So I would make it simple, uh, stenting as much as possible, optimize, because I know she won't come back again. So I need her to be really in a good, uh, in a good clinical condition, anatomically, with the angiography, angioplasty, using imaging, as mentioned earlier, that is one thing with a short-term DAP because she may require surgery for whatever reason, and uh, that's how I would do. So one vessel, three vessels, in this case, I would go for all the three because the complexity of the vessels are not that bad, so I would rather to go all in one. Well, some uh, For sure, I, we need to fix uh, the three, uh, but uh, I would go the at least LED and RCA, the most two critical, and then uh, we'll bring her back for the CERC. If she didn't show up, uh, you know, what, I mean, I, I will not fix the three at the same time. I will just go for two. Okay, so we will uh, uh, move to the to Toulouse, and uh, they start by the, uh, proxy, the uh, proximal mid LED lesion. They consider uh, this uh, lesion as a culprit lesion. And uh, <clears throat> so it was an uh, LED or FDI guided uh, PCI uh, using the <coughs> uh, radial uh, access. You could see here the diffuseness of the uh, disease from the really proximal LED to the, uh, the origin of the, the distal uh, LED and the two critical lesion, uh, particularly the lesion involving the origin of the second diagonal. So they predilate uh, with the mid LED with that uh, 2.0 millimeter balloon. Uh, they place a wire, uh, uh, a protection wire in the di diagonal branch. They insert a Terimo Ultimaster Nagomi of uh, 2.5 by 33 millimeter, and uh, according to the, uh, the result of the intravascular imaging evaluation, they move to the uh, pot using a 3.0 uh, non-compliant balloon, uh, followed by the kissing balloon uh, uh, with LED uh, diagonal and the final uh, port uh, result. This is the uh, result that we could, uh, with, uh, that we obtain in the uh, uh, mid and uh, the distal uh, LED with an excellent uh, apposition. Uh, and uh, <coughs> this is the final angiographic uh, result after the 3.5 by 24 uh, Terimo uh, Nagumi result in the proximal uh, LED. So this is the, <coughs> the, the, the result of the intraconary imaging showing uh, a good expansion of the stent, the absence of uh, malaposition, uh, and uh, in the proximal uh, global uh, mid uh, MSA at 4.8 uh, square millimeter. So now we have uh, the CT situation with this octogenary and uh, really fragile female. Uh, we present a non STEMI with LVEF of 45%, three vessel, uh, three vessel disease with three critical lesion on LED and significant lesion on the LCXOM and the proximal right coronary artery. And uh, <coughs> in the very high uh, Brady risk uh, woman. So now we can uh, move to the, uh, the CAT lab. Okay. So you can see here we are with, with the uh, extra backup 3.5 uh, guiding catheter. And you can see nicely first the critical lesion of the uh, uh, 
proximal circumflex. It seems not massively calcified, not a very calcified lesion. And then you have the second lesion at the level of the bifurc bifurcation between the first marginal and the second marginal. The main branch is definitely the first marginal branch. The second marginal is, is a, a smaller and a, with a quite long disease, but seems not critical. So uh, we already have put the two wires in the, in the first marginal and second marginal, and we have, will acquire, we have acquired the OFDI free evaluation. And the OFDI, and if we can launch the run from the distal first marginal to the proximal uh, circumflex, you can appreciate that there is mild disease on the distal. The Important stenosis at yeah. the ostium of the first marginal, and we, you can see the second guide wire coming from the second marginal. It's not very calcified. You have some mild calcification, eccentric more. The proximal lesion on circumflex, and finally, this uh, quite earthy landing zone on the uh, proximal LCX. We can appreciate that the uh, length of the lesion is 43 millimeters, and the objective is really to implant the less metal, so we will try to use only one stent to cover all the lesion. And if we go back on the distal uh, diameters, uh, you can appreciate that the mean lumen is nearly 2 or 2.20, the difference in the measure, so we will go for a 2.5, because yeah. I remember when we use uh, the lumen diameters, you have to increase to 0.25 your uh, stent diameters. And if we go on the proximal part of the circumflex, the very proximal part, you can see, you can appreciate that we are nearly 3.1, so 3.2 difference, so maybe we will optimize to 3 to 25, 25, 25 and we will control it by a final OFDI. So here's a step, the, the objective is to prepare the lesion with conventional balloon because there is no heavy calcification, use a 2.5 by 44 millimeters Nagomi stent. This is a new lens, and so in this patient, it's perfect. We will use it and optimize to 3.25 on the proximal part and 2.75 on the mid part. Okay. And uh, so now we will go for uh, the long stent. Huh? Uh, 2.5 millimeters according to the FDI, 44 millimeters. So this is the new Nagomi stent, and I'm, I know that you will talk about it. Uh, new size, three platforms, a new length, and so uh, and uh, a possibility to increase uh, the the cells uh, on uh, up to 6.25 for the for the, last for, the la for the most in last platform for the large vessel platform. Yeah. And you see, it's, go it's going very smoothly. You can appreciate and there is a new hydrophilic coating and uh, it seems very useful in terms of uh, this uh, long stent and you can appreciate that the, tw the 44 millimeters lens uh, coming very easily uh, through the different lesion. Of course, this is not a, 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 a so complex lesion, but it's a long one. So maybe... Uh, okay. Okay. Maybe we can pull back a little bit. Just yeah? pull back a little okay. bit. I think it's correct. Maybe we'll do a another test and then we can deploy yes, the stand. Yes. Uh, yeah, you... maybe a last on you to okay. be sure of the best move. We have time, we control, I think it's okay. correct. Huh? Good. Correct. So I will deploy the stand gently at 12 atmosphere. We know that we will mm. need after to do pot, no problem. I will inflate uh, the balloon at uh, least 10 seconds Be Benjamin because it's working. a long stand. Clearly for me, I, I will try to, be, to stay away <laughs> from this uh, second marginal branch, except if uh, really there is a concern in terms of flow or uh, for the patient. Uh, 275. Okay, it's a 275 and we try to be just at the level of the camera carema, so maybe the marker will be, uh, the distal marker of the balloon is just at the separation of the two, mi of the two wire, yeah. just uh, after the separation of the two wire. I think I have to advance a little bit. And you and see, you see here yeah. the separation. I'm, I'm not convinced that the, the the stent is fully open at the yeah. level of the ostium. I agree. Maybe we have to come back with Maybe the two five. To buy, yeah, we have the two five twenty. We can reuse it. Maybe we do the pot first here, and I will. I agree with you that we have to come back after with the two five non-compliant balloon at the level of the ostium of the first marginal branch. 
So here I can go up to 20. We have inside the stand, so no issue. Maybe we can make a stand, uh, stand, stand to see if, after. after to see if we have some improvement. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's nicely yeah. better. Right? Yeah. We can see, you can appreciate. Yeah. Okay. I think that well, there is some uh, worsening at the level of the ostium, but the flow is normal. And once again, I will be very happy uh, if this stays like this, and I will not touch it for sure. So, it's a vis encore. Okay. Well, il faut que vous enlèves le pied. Vas-y. I think it's correct here. Yeah. Uh, we see. Yeah. Yeah. It's so a 325 millimeter balloon, according to the result of the OFDI. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. What we can say, the, the result at the level of the circumflex and the first marginal uh, branch is, uh, for me, good, angiographically, I will say, and we, will, we know that we will control it by OFDI. Regarding the problem, the issue of the second marginal branch, there is some disease, there is some quite uh, significant narrowing at the level of the proximal part, but it's a long disease, and if we stay like this, I will not touch it definitely. Maybe we can uh, ask to, do, to you if you will go further for a kissing, to this barge but personally, I will leave it like this. Absolutely. This is the angiographic result after removing the, uh, the uh, wire of the second marginal. Once again, uh, we, we are quite uh, satisfied by this result. And maybe now, if you agree, we can move to the OFDI evaluation to see if uh, stent of optimization is needed or if the result is actually uh, satisfied. There is no edge dissection distalization. No. Correct. So that this is the first. This is the point. first point. After, if we come back, uh, we can appreciate that the stent is well opposed and well expanded. Uh, there is, uh, we you, see the you can appreciate the bifurcation, but there, there is a slight malaposition. Maybe our pot was not uh, enough uh, uh, deep in distal in the bifurcation. We have this impression in our geography. Uh, I can remember that uh, a definition of malaposition is uh, for 400 microns. Uh, however, we will correct it because uh, we want a, a perfect uh, result for this patient, IHBR. And if we go uh, on the proximal part, there is also some uh, malaposition yeah. threat in the proximal part, yeah. yeah. So maybe we will optimize well, yeah. uh, with a... A 3-0 uh, for this study, because when we see the, yeah. the first malaposition, we see that the diameter was close to 2.9, and in fact, we, we use a 275, yeah. and probably it was too uh, small. Uh, but we, we rely to the first evaluation of the OFDI. And then for the proximal, I think we need to go with a 3.5. Okay? So Definitely. we will a little bit up, up, upgrade the, the diameter of the balloon. Uh, we go with a 3.0 millimeter for the mid part of the, just before the bifurcation, if you agree. And then we come back with a 3.5 for the proximal part. Okay. Yeah. So yes, like this. Deflation. So I go up to 20 atmosphere with a 3.5. Okay, okay, okay no complication in angiography. Okay, we can inject. It seems better, huh? Yeah, yeah it's definitely better. it seems better. Yeah. Oh, it's much better. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. Yeah. Okay, there is still a slight malaposition yeah. stop, if you can... One, one shot there, in the proximal. Maybe, yeah, only one shot with a very short 3.5 by 8 yeah. millimeters balloon, please. And after, as you mentioned, Thomas, on the first yeah. end of the yeah. stand... Can you just come back a little bit? Uh, yeah. There is a malaposition, so uh, we will... Uh, Try to uh, just or to correct that, and after the the the, the job will be over. Twenty two atmosphere, three point five. So okay, so it's nice. 
Yeah, I yeah. think uh, it's a very nice result. We will try to avoid to make another OFDI run, as you mentioned. Uh, it's an old patient, there is a lot of iodium. Uh, I yeah. think the results have been optimized no. by the two runs, so I will uh, leave it like this. I don't know what's your, what is the comment of the panel, but I think uh, in this lesion we won't do more. No, okay. I think yeah, it's, um, it's well no, it's more. Perfect. So uh, you see the, the angiography of the right. It's a quite tricky right coronary with an uh, up, uh, up, upward uh, origin. So Benjamin selected uh, a standard GR4 guiding catheter, but prob the discussion was to use uh, maybe also uh, an Amplatz guiding catheter in order to have a better support. Right, there is uh, an important angulation, and so maybe the GR is not the good guiding catheter. But we'll we see. The, we use a 3.520 millimeter length balloon, non-compliant, and I think that it's is maybe here. Okay, I think you cross. Uh, it's, uh, okay, here. Bruno, it's 3.5 non-compliant balloon? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So it's a good uh, challenge for the Nagomi platform. Yeah, it will be a good challenge for the 4 millimeters Nagomi platform. Uh, so, Let's say okay. four millimeters by 20. Uh, 4 zero. 24. And with the Nagomi, you, you will be able to go up to four, five, or even five, or you go no. up to, yeah. to six, so it's, uh, it will not be an issue, I think. Okay, so he crossed, you see? Very nice crossing. Now we have to. It's yeah. interaction, so have to the good stent and the good operator, I think. Yeah. A good stand, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, both. Okay. <laughs> Test. I think it's correct, huh? Yeah, Maybe. it's always difficult to, uh, to place when the curve is releasing by the guide wire. Uh, yeah, like this, it's okay, huh? Yes. Yes. Okay, but now you have to re-advance. It goes uh, out. Yeah. yeah. Now it's out. Yeah. Okay. 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 In order that the stand is... Fully okay. Are you okay? I think uh, we are on the good pace. Okay. Maybe for an angio. Yeah. I think yeah, it's, it's okay. Good. Okay. I catch it. <laughs> I think you. Okay. So, uh, you had the lesion. Oh, very nice. Yeah. yeah. Some yeah, nitrates. You see, there is some plaque distally, but it's. Uh, but yeah. We avoid. She yeah. was. She was pre-existent be before. I think it's. Uh, yeah. There is no significant dissection. We will optimize at. Uh, Four point five. Four point five. Yeah. By, uh, Deflation. Mm. It's Excellent. It's beautiful. Okay. Huh? It's, uh, yeah, beautiful. This is the final Anjo, so uh, yeah, if you don't so mind, I think uh, in this patient we will uh, yeah. stay like that. Yeah, of course. Of course. So we'd like to, yeah. to thank you because this case really brings a lot yeah, of... Yeah, thank you. This is uh, an example of uh, what we could achieve uh, using this uh, Nagomi stand. Uh, really interesting in this particular situation. Why? Because first, this fragile patient, 80 years old, high bleeding risk, and uh, so we need at least only one month the APT duration. That's the first point. Second, you saw that uh, uh, the facility to uh, cross uh, this uh, lesion of the right coronary, proximal right coronary artery with a poor support with the Judkins uh, catheter. And this, uh, the deliverability of the, the system is really excellent. And uh, the, the other advantage is the, this uh, capacity to be uh, expanded from 2.5 millimeter up to 3.5 millimeter, from 3, 3 millimeter to 4.5 millimeter uh, without absolutely no problem on the structure of the stand. And this was really interesting in this kind of long lesion. Uh, if you consider the difference in diameter in the proximal LED and the distal LED, and the same for the circumflex uh, first OM, 
with a proximal di diameter of 4.5 mm and a distal diameter around 2.7 mm. So with the same stand, with this capacity to be overexpanded without any problem on the structure, uh, this is really interesting for this kind of uh, patient with a long free vessel uh, disease when we need to uh, perform a complete vascularization. But it's true that in this particular patient, the most interest uh, of the, uh, this uh, uh, Nagomi stent is the, uh, on the single man's uh, DAPT, uh, which is really a major, major advantage. And again, the, the study have demonstrated the absolute safety of the one man's DAPT. Any comment? Well, uh, I did my training at the intervention cardiology at uh, uh, McGill University, and there was a, a senior consultant there. GB Baudre, he usually tell me if you put 2.5 cent in LED, uh, you know, it's a, it's a disaster. But now with the technology, 2.5 cent, 2.5, it goes, uh, we, we saw 3.5 balloon uh, flaring the stent. What is interesting about middle, our region here, the, si uh, the, the size of the, uh, the patient is totally different from Europe and North America. So uh, most of the people, uh, uh, inherited that, you know, we're going to put a small stent. Uh, and, and if you do OCT or IFAS for, for this, uh, you know, uh, kind of 2.5 millimeter small stent, um, you will find it it's under expanded. You know, uh, now, if, if for the people who, who love to put small stent, do IFAS or OCT like what we saw, and then with this stent you can upsize, you go to 3, 3.25. It's a brilliant technology, and I think it's a good stent for the region here, and the, the deliverability is amazing. It's amazing. Any comment uh, or question from the, the audience? Do not hesitate to take, uh, use uh, the microphone. Thanks for the nice illustration. We, we have uh, good trust from the TENSI because it keeps the side branches. You can upsize, so we are already practicing it. But I might not be exaggerating. Uh, if you uh, face this high-risk bleeding patient in daily basis, your colleague in the ICU will tell you, please take the patient. Troponin is jumping, and ECG is deteriorating. And you will take the patient in high risk second day please, I need to stop the antiplatelet because I need to do tracheostomy. The patient is leaking in her stomach. There is melina. So I feel that one month in real practice is a bit luxurious. This is not happening in critical patient. Sometimes you need to keep the patient on single antiplatelet after one day. So how our expertise is solving this problem? Thank you. Any I comment, mean, that is, that is exception that can happen any time with anyone. I mean, that is uh, something that we don't have data. You stop a dwelling place, you pray, you keep him at the hospital, put him in whatever. But that's uh, bad luck, <laughs> or what I can say. But there's no sense uh, you could do maybe in case you are predicting something like this in advance that he may go for high risk, may go with balloon just and do some soft massage and then wait. Uh, depends on the clinical presentation, but uh, then this can apply on all patients. So what to do if somebody gets it, a RTA, car accident, can happen to anyone next day. Uh, there's no solution for this. Rasha, any comment? Yeah, um, I agree. I think there are some stents platform with the one month depth safety use. So I would, if there's any concern about those patients, I would go with that. Even though we say one month, but I think a couple of days, if there's high bleeding risk, everyone is not going to be comfortable putting them on the antiplatelet. Uh, but that's when imaging guided is extremely helpful because you know that the expansion is good. The risk of stent thrombosis is going to be very low if you stop it. So good preparation, good stenting, uh, image guided. And obviously, if something happens, it's outside your prediction, then you have to take the risks. Other question? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I wanted to ask about master depth study, because in master depth study, if you want to uh, give abbreviated course of antiblitlet, you have to be sure you are well opposed to. You have to use imaging in these cases. How many? The, uh, how? Uh, I, I wonder. Can you use this abbreviated, and you are dependent on NGO only guided PCI? So because you don't know about the intravascular imaging. Uh, I don't think uh, without using 
uh, you know, tons of study reveal that angiographic, uh, you know, uh, angiographically, you know, there's at least 20 to 30 percent of the cells undersized if you use OCT or IPS. So uh, imaging, at least for the uh, proximal lesions in LED, CERC, and RCA, should be done with IPS and, or, or OCT. So you mean that you cannot generalize the use of abbreviated uh, DAPT uh, or NGO? Yeah. You cannot generalize yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I just want to ask, is it safe to do a balloon dilatation for a proximal part and put over a gelled wire? I have seen in this slide and the uh, OM branch, the second OM branch, is doing uh, dilatation, and while the uh, gelled wire is not a freed, for, yeah. so is it safe to do that or not? It used to be the concern before that you might have a stent, the wire could be fractured or trapped. Yes. Uh, yes. But nowadays, I don't think this is a concern anymore, especially if you're worried about losing that branch. So leaving the wire behind might actually help you keep it open. Uh, but obviously, no advancement of any balloons or anything. But um, nowadays, it's pretty safe. Maybe, maybe the choice BT wire, we don't uh, gel. But I, I never see live transmission for Dr. Fajide unless he gel the wire. Thank you. Arif, what we are doing? No, I, I don't have any Bifurcation, two wires, post-dilatation. I, after I never had, frankly, said over my uh, years. I don't remember having trapped or wire lost. Uh, it can happen. I've seen it in many situations. And I cannot uh, expect that this won't happen. It can happen to anyone at any time. Uh, I would be having concern long distance jailing, calcified lesion, exactly. more post dilating, a lot of extensive post dilating proximal part. That I might be having concerns. So I would do optimization of that by remove the wire and then do more part, more intensive. That's how I would do so, avoid this kind of situation. And especially with the hydrophilic wires, I may have sometimes the coating might also get uh, somehow dismantled. No, it should be exactly my, the, the, the same uh, answer. In other words, if we have a standard number, uh, coronary artery, like uh, here in this case, this was not massive calcification, uh, and uh, the lesion was uh, quite uh, straight. It was long, but quite straight. You can do it. And uh, really, we cannot say zero uh, risk of, uh, uh, of a problem, but uh, it's really safe. But if we have a long, torturous, calcified vessel with a really diffuse calcification, it's better to remove the side, uh, side branch wire before the last uh, uh, port. Other question, comment? Any, any comment uh, on this uh, the technology? No, I, I'm glad that we have now finally uh, for left main a 6.25. <laughs> we are yeah. escalating, we are going up and up. More length, more variety of the expansion uh, of the diameter. I, I think everything, every tool, every new technology, every add is something to our uh, toolbox will be beneficial for our patients' optimization. Absolutely. So, yeah, I'm glad to hear this, the new technology has. Yeah, yeah it's true that uh, uh, well, I'm not uh, now uh, from the uh, young generation of interventional cardiologists. I'm doing this since uh, 40 years. And uh, but I remember the time when the, it was really difficult to have a, a, a stand uh, opening uh, uh, over 10 percent, that's the, the real uh, diameter, the maximum diameter. So it was really difficult when we place a stent to, and do we realize, yeah, at that time there was no IVUS or, uh, but we realized angiographically that the stent was not really open. It was really difficult to uh, post dilate at the, at the right size of the vessel. Here, the, what is fantastic in this technology is when we have a long diffuse disease lesion with a really a major difference in diameter between the proximal segment of the vessel and the distal segment of the vessel, you can select the size of your stent, of your long stent, 
uh, according to the size of the distal uh, vessel, and then post delayed really safely without any problem on the structure uh, because of this uh, capacity of compliance uh, of the stent in the proximal segment. So this technically, it's a really, really, really uh, uh, great uh, advantage for the, uh, for, for, for the patients. Comment? I, I, I have a, um, a question, I don't know. But really, 6.25 is very nice, but I don't recall that even we have a 6.25 balloon. The, the biggest balloon is six, and uh, it, it's non-compliant. It's not a semi-compliant, so it we can expand. So I think that we need to ask Trumo to uh, give us a, a 6.25 balloon. That was a, I was just uh, thinking about it. Yeah, yeah but this how is, can we do reach this? Yeah, but this is a uh, which type of six millimeter vessel? Uh, certainly the graft. Uh, we can have uh, uh, this uh, indication in the saphenous vein graft. Sometimes you have a huge uh, conduct. Uh, in the native coronary artery, uh, it's, it's really rare to go over 5.5 five, 5 millimeter. You're right. So we are on time, eh? uh, just uh, one minute late. So uh, it's, uh, I would like to thank you, Rasha. Thank you, Well. Thank you, RF. Uh, for this uh, interesting. Thank you, uh, uh, all of you. The room was uh, full. Thank you for your question. If you have uh, any question, problem, uh, you have the booth of the room all, and uh, you can uh, ask uh, all the technical questions uh, on the booth. I wish you a nice uh, uh, afternoon, and uh, see you uh, very soon. Thank you.